The longer we stay in real estate, the more often we're probably going to start hearing value add. And the concept makes sense, right? We know we need to add value, but the question really is how, or better yet, how can I find ways to add value that other people are missing or they don't just don't see? So in today's video, we're going to cover some of the most common ways to add value, but we're also going to touch on some secret tips that you may not have heard of before. So let's hop right into it. Now, in order to understand exactly how to add value, it's probably good that we recap over how to find value in the first place. So what we're going to do is we're going to take all of the potential income of a property. What we mean by that is not only the rents, but if there's any other income source at all for the property, we want to keep that in mind. So this includes parking fees and, and things like that, but I'm going to save a whole list of them for once we get into the value add. So stay tuned for that. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to subtract the vacancy. And so the vacancy just means how many units are not occupied right now, or on average out of the years that we've had history history on what's the average vacancy rate for the year. Now, once we subtract the vacancy rate from the potential income, well, now we're going to come out to our effective gross income. Now that we have the effective gross income, I like to think of this as real revenue. You know, we, we looked at the potential income the company can make. However, after vacancy rate and some of the other things that, that happen in life of owning a property, what's left over that effective gross income is what we actually have to spend on the property. So from that effective gross income, we're now going to subtract all of the operating expenses associated with the property. Now there's some shades of gray when we come to operating expenses as far as what actually falls into that category and what doesn't. But for the most part, I want you to think about what belongs specifically to this property. So that would be your management fees. If you have a third party property manager, your utility bills, if you're paying any portion of the utilities that your tenants aren't, um, your lawn care, if that's required, so forth and so on. Those are going to be tied specifically to the property and they're Therefore, those are going to be operational expenses. So after you add up all of the operational expenses, you're now going to subtract that from the effective gross income. And now you're left with the net operating income or NOI for short. Now that net operating income, that's our baby. That's what we're looking for. That right there is going to determine the overall value of the property. And the reason that's the case is because we're taking that net operating income and then we're going to divide that by the market cap rate. Now don't stress on the cap rate. I can make an entire video about that. It's not as complex as it seems. And it's also nowhere near as important as you might think it is. But for right now, we just need to know that the NOI is going to be divided by the cap rate. So let's go through a quick example. All right. Let's say that the net operating income was $300,000 for the year and the cap rate, the market cap rate was 8%. So we're going to take that 300,000 and we're going to divide it by that 8% and it's going to give us a total value of $3,750,000. So to show you the impact of the net operating income very specifically, let's say that the NOI was three hundred dollars $50,000. That means we found a way to add $50,000 worth of value to this property. And we divided it by the same cap rate by 8%. The new value of the property would be $4,375,000. So that simple $50,000 that we were able to add value in over the course of a year equals $625,000 worth of value of the property overall. That's a huge amount of value. So now we want to figure out how can we add every additional dollar to our NOI by the end of the year. And before we jump into it, guys, if you want to continue to support Mike, we really appreciate it. Go ahead and hit the like. And also let me know what you think about the, the pink, right? This uh, salmon color. Right? I changed up the background a little bit, changed it from the blue, and I may just continue to change it to give you something different to look at, but just let me know what your thoughts are. Okay. So the first absolute thing we want to look at is non-property specific expenses. Remember in the beginning, we were talking about lawn care, utilities, and all that other good stuff that is tied specifically to the performance of the property. Well, as you start to look at more profit and loss statements or trailing 12s, you're going to start to see a lot of different line items pop up underneath that expense report. Because remember, as the owner of the property, we want to try to show as little income as possible so we can you know, avoid taxes as much as possible, or at least hedge ourselves against taxes. We don't want to avoid taxes. We're not going to the IRS, but we want to legally pay as little as possible. So one of the things that you would immediately see often is going to be things like, uh, mileage or office expenses or meals. So although those expenses are legitimate, right? And you can figure out how to use these in your favor in this video here, where I talk about how to save money as a business owner overall. However, when we think about it, the property itself isn't going anywhere. There's no mileage associated with the property, right? The owner may have traveled to visit the property or traveled to a meeting and counted it as business mileage, but the property itself didn't go anywhere. And the same thing applies to meals. The 
property ain't eating nothing. That's the owner, right? And again, it may have been a business meeting where he decided to eat, but it doesn't apply to the property. So as soon as we go through the profit and loss statement and we start seeing things that are typical of the owner for the intent of reducing their tax obligation, well, what we need to do is scratch that out immediately. Those do not apply when we're actually evaluating the net operating income of the property. Now, this may take some time and it may require you to run through the profit and loss statements a few times before you feel confident that all the expenses that are actually on that profit and loss statement really apply to the building. But when you do it correctly, you can immediately find ways to add value. Oftentimes, you'll see the mileage and the meals expense be somewhere in the thousands of dollars or more. If you were to take that off, you're now in a great position. You just added a couple thousand dollars to your NOI. Now, once you've done that, we're still in the same mindset of expense control, right? We just got rid of a whole bunch of expenses that do not apply to the property. So let's stay in that same vein. So the next thing you're going to do is you're going to evaluate the expenses. So let's take that a little bit deeper. When you're looking at the profit and loss statement, and now you do see the expenses that are specific to the property, the lawn care, the utilities, and so forth, you have to ask yourself, is this market price or is there a relationship that you might have where we can reduce this? One primary example of that would be with property managers. Now, if you have property managers, oftentimes on the single family side of the house, they'll say it's a 10% property management. And as you scale doors, typically you'll see the property managers start to reduce their fee to 8%, 7%, so forth and so on. And it's not uncommon to see large apartment buildings um, have a management fee around 6%, 4% or even less. Now, a topic for another day is how those property management companies charge you in different areas to make up for the difference. But either way, like if you have a property manager in that area that you like and you already have an agreement with them and say, for example, this profit and loss statement shows that the property management fee is 10%. But again, your guy charges you 7%. Boom. Immediately, that's a 3% on that fee as far as a value add goes. In addition to that, if you have a lawn guy that you can negotiate with or you happen to have a repair guy that handles other properties for you and you know you can get cheaper services, then these things all can be reduced as you're reviewing the profit and loss statement. Because remember, the ultimate goal is finding places to add value. So although when you buy it, it may be performing a certain way, the goal is find as many ways as possible to increase that NOI. One of the easiest ways to start is with the expenses. So now let's talk about some of those secret ways that you can decrease the expenses to really start adding some value. So one technique that is practiced often is called rubs, which is a ratio utility billing system. I know it sounds super fancy, but essentially what that means is, hey, look, as the landlord, I'm already in charge of these utilities for one reason or another. Sometimes it's because the water all works on one central meter or the electricity works on one central meter, meaning that although you may have 10 units that are using that same water and electricity, it's not individually billed out, meaning we don't understand exactly how much tenant one or tenant four used when it comes to electricity or water. So you still have to pay it. But what we're going to do is we're actually going to bill back the tenants to make sure that we get that entire utility bill covered. And so the way that that can work is let's say that each unit is specifically a certain square footage. Well, if that's the case, then we know that all of them are the same square footage. Then we're just going to simply divide our utility bill by 10 units or however many units there are because it's equal. Now on the flip side, let's say that one unit was half the size as the other. Well, then we're going to try to proportionally rate exactly what the difference is based on size of the unit. And then that's how we're going to bill back the utilities that way. And guess what, guys, it doesn't have to only apply to the utilities themselves. This model or this method can also be applied when you're thinking of a triple net lease, right? Typically in a triple net lease, this is where the landlord is saying that the tenant is responsible for a certain portion of the taxes, the insurance, and the common area maintenance. So we're reducing these expenses by essentially making the tenants cover them, which still impacts our NOI. Another thing that you can consider is depending on how many units you actually own and what type of units they are, then maybe you can buy a ton of replacements or maintenance materials in bulk and save a ton of money that way. For example, let's use apartment buildings. If every single one of them have a kitchen, every single one of them have a toilet, every single one of them have a vanity, so forth and so on, we can just simply buy the same exact model of the refrigerator, the sink, the vanity, and just store it, try to buy it in bulk and get a discount and use every discount you have, military discount, senior citizens discount, I don't care. Add that on top of the bulk discount. And yes, we'll need a place to store it, but hey, that's when you can use a synthetic lease, which there's a video right here about what a synthetic lease is and how you can use it for your own company to save some money. But by having it all there, now we don't have to worry about delays and orders. We don't have to worry about price fluctuations.
situation with it going up over the next couple of months or a shortage supply. Uh, so therefore, with the uh, increase in demand and shortage in supply, now the price just skyrockets. We don't have to worry about that when we buy things in bulk that way, which over the course of the three, the five, the seven years that you're owning this property, you can add a ton of value simply by just saving and how much you spend on the items that you know you're going to need. And finally, the piece de la resistance when we're thinking about how can we reduce expenses is by bringing in every single expense that we have in house. Now, to be clear, this is a big step. I'm saying, you know, this is where you're bringing in your property management, your lawn care, everything that you can think of uh, is in house, meaning you own the company itself. Now, this can happen for a few reasons, but one of the most common reasons is that your portfolio has grown enough that it can self sustain all of these other costs because, you know, now we have to hire new labor and, and new personnel to do all of these things as well. But the big kicker here is that instead of it just disappearing as an expense on one asset, it's actually now flowing from one asset to another asset. So you can simply recycle that money and keep it all in house, which overall for your portfolio of companies is drastically going to increase your performance across the board. Now, I did say this was a big step, right? So I'm not saying this is going to be applicable for everybody, but if this is something that you're considering, it's one of the best ways to cut expenses. Now, we're all aware that we can only reduce our expenses so much. I mean, we still have to think about it in our lifestyle, right? Although we may be personally budgeting, we still have to eat. We still have to live somewhere. We still have to get around and travel and transportation. So even if we try to cut it all back bare bones, there will always be an expense associated with just breathing. So once we reduce the expenses as much as we can, we always have to remember what is the formula for the NOI. It's essentially your income minus your expenses. So the expenses are as tight as we can get it. The only other variable that we can change now is our income, which leads us to the next way to add value, which is increasing your income. And this is the one that we can get extremely creative with. So the most common practice in order to increase income is to increase what? That's right. You got it is to increase rent. Many people preach all the time. Hey, in order to increase value or to add value, you simply need to increase rent. So when you're looking for properties to buy, you should buy properties that have rents less than market value because, you know, it may be hard to just jack up rents higher than market value, but it's very simple to simply say, hey, look, you're paying $300 less than what this property should be getting. So if you don't come up, then we'll just evict you once your lease is done, or we won't re-sign a new lease with you. And we'll go get somebody, just anybody who's willing to pay market rent for your property. Very simple, easy peasy. Now we've added value. And yes, that's true. It's a very simplistic way to think of how do we add value. But now we want to know where can we get into the nooks and crannies and really start to jam in some more value. So here are two more very common ways to add value that you've probably seen this in your lifetime. The first one is going to be with pets. By allowing pets, we now can charge a monthly reoccurring pet fee, or we can charge a fairly significant pet deposit fee in the beginning. Now, the logic behind it is, yo, this pet fee and pet deposit is like an insurance policy. In case this pet tears this place up, at least I got some money to kind of, you know, rent and, or turn over and make it nice again. But in reality, not every pet is going to mess up every unit. So oftentimes, this is just additional income for the overall profit and loss statement. And the second very common way is to charge for additional parking. Oftentimes in, in apartment complexes, very specifically, you may be assigned one or two parking spaces with your unit, and then you have to pay for any additional parking if you have additional vehicles. And hell, even for some of these beautiful class A, you know, prime urban district apartment buildings that are behind like gates and all that stuff, you still got to pay your $2,500 a month in rent, and they're still going to charge you an additional 10 to 15 to 20 dollars to use the parking as well either way that goes having that additional parking fee remember the use of the parking fee is on concrete it's just a concrete slab and so now what you're doing is you're creating income off a piece of the property that has little to no maintenance at all maybe you power wash it and maybe if you get a pothole you fix it in 10 or 15 years so that's one of the easiest ways to add value when you're charging for space that is going to be used but has very little little maintenance at all involved with it. So those two were pretty straightforward, but now let's get into some things that many people don't think about. So one of the sexiest asset classes right now are storage units. And why is that? It's because people will go and they'll rent out these storage spaces because 
they don't want to lose what they already own. So much so that they even have an entire theory about it called the prospect theory. This says that people strongly prefer to avoid losing things than they would rather gain things. So they made an entire industry around it. How insane is that? But you don't necessarily have to own self-storage units in order to take advantage of that. Oftentimes now you'll see that these apartment complexes actually offer storage units as well. And the concept will be very similar. You're going to rent out this space for a fairly low charge. It could be anywhere from $35 to $50 a month. And people are going to put their stuff in there and they're going to be happy to do so because it's going to be within close proximity and they don't have to get rid of anything. And just like the parking lots, the self-storage doesn't have any maintenance. This doesn't just apply to apartment buildings because you can have storage units for different companies if you own a retail strip as well. Our stores may have extra inventory or something along those lines where they would like to have storage. And so therefore, boom, we can now add value. The next one is a laundry facility. So nowadays, many apartment complexes actually do offer a washer and dryer either inside the unit or somewhere on the campus. Now it's important to note that if you provide any of these washing and dryer equipment as the owner, then that means it's your responsibility to fix it up down the road. So instead of incurring an expense by buying all the material and then creating overhead by having to maintain it, we can go out and simply just rent the equipment from a company that solely focuses on renting and maintaining laundry facilities. And the best part about this is we can get very creative on how we negotiate that contract. For example, some companies may say, yes, we need an upfront fee in order for us to fill out uh, whatever facilities that you have, whatever units that you have. Then from that day forward, they may ask for a certain fixed amount uh, that you give them back. Or you can work out a profit share or a revenue share model, meaning, hey, you come and put all your machines up and out of every person that uses this machine we will give you 70% of the profit. So let's look at how those two models work. So the first part where we're just saying, Hey, pay a flat fee. That'll be fine. As long as we know that we can rent it out to the individual tenants for more than what that flat fee is. So for example, we know to get a washer and dryer, we have to pay that company $200 a month. However, we go to the tenant and we charge them $500 a month if they want us to supply the washer and dryer. Therefore we can collect the difference of $300 a month. And that $300 a month now goes to our NOI as far as increasing our income. On the other hand, let's say that we have a ton of apartments, but we decided to create a laundry facility on the campus site where there's 30 washers and dryers, but people have to travel to it from their apartments over to that facility. Well, in that case, anytime somebody comes to use that washer and dryer, use that equipment, we might have a credit card machine or some sort of place to capture payment so they can pay for each load that they do instead of paying a monthly fee and they only use it four or five times for the month. Every single time we capture one of their payments, we just simply split it. 70% goes to the company, 30% goes to us. However, we never had to pay for the equipment. We're not responsible for maintaining the equipment. And therefore, anytime somebody uses it, it's purely a profit on our end at no expense. Now on that same vein of revenue or profit share, the last two things that you can bring to potentially add value that many people don't consider are an ATM machine and a vending machine. Now, both of these operate fairly the same same way. The machine typically is owned by somebody else. It's somebody whose whole business model is through owning a vending machine or an ATM machine, meaning that the responsibility of stocking it with new money or new snacks belongs to the owner. The responsibility for maintaining it if something breaks belongs to the owner. And because of that, a majority of whatever is made will go back to the owner. However, the owner needs a place to put these equipments or these machines in order to make any money at all. So that's where the negotiation begins. For our commercial properties like gas stations, retail, stores, Dollar Generals, any of those things, an ATM would make a ton of sense. Any other commercial properties where there's a large pool of people, office places, warehouses, so forth and so on, a vending machine would make a ton of sense. And at apartment complexes, if you actually had a front office area, both machines could make a ton of sense. Ultimately, by adding either or, you're now able to add an income with no additional expense, which is only an upside to the NOI. Now you're empowered with all the information you need to identify areas to add value. Value. And remember, we talked about cap rate a little bit earlier in this video, and you guys can go ahead and check out this video right here, which is the cap rate explained, right? So now we can break it all the way down to what it actually is and how it applies to everything. But in my opinion, the NOI is the most important factor. So there's only one other thing to do. Tell me how you like this show. See you in the next video.